Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership series. I'm Scott Miller and I serve as your weekly host. Today I'm honored to be joined by Franklin Covey's Chief People Officer and perhaps as important the author of the new blockbuster best-selling book Get Better. Welcome Todd Davis, glad Thanks, you're Todd. here. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for joining us on our new set. You're our second guest it's in beautiful. studio. You'll notice your book on the back wall as well. <laughs> See that, I'll just look right up here. Sort of our wall of fame, right? <laughs> this uh, studio set represents really the collection of the books that have had the biggest impact on my career, my thinking in the last 20 or 30 years or so. And so I'm delighted that yours actually made it because I like it as well. So this is kind of all about you. Well, um, <laughs> some about you and some about okay. me. How's that? Okay. So Get Better, you've authored this new book. It came out last November. That's right. Sold blockbuster sales, nearly 35, th more than 35,000 copies in the first 100 days. Yeah. That's a good sign to any publisher. It was exciting. Um, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book. Well, I've been, uh, as you mentioned, I'm the Chief People Officer of Franklin Covey. I've been here for 22 years. 14, 15 years of that, I've been in the Chief People Officer role. So I've been in a unique position where I've had numerous reps at helping people with their relationships, just to, to put that bluntly. And, and I've seen over and over again people who are masters at their relationships, and I've seen people, really good people, who trip up over things, including myself. And so from all of those years of experience, I put together these practices and behaviors that I've seen time and time again that we can all learn and get better at to become true masters at our relationships, which makes the difference in everything. So more about the book in a second. Tell us about your journey. How does someone become a chief people officer, especially a Franklin <laughs> Covey? Yeah, well, we had a drawing, and I pulled the right <laughs> and the wrong lost. number. And you lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I began with what was then called the Covey Leadership Center 22 years ago before we merged with Franklin Quest, and I had done recruitment in the, the medical industry for a number of years. So I came on as, as a recruiter for Covey Leadership Center. Uh, we merged companies. I had done some training development in a previous life, so I worked in our innovations department for many years, helping create some of our our flagship programs and then as I mentioned 15 years ago had the good fortune to talk with our president and our CEO about uh, filling a vacancy that had been left in the in mm -hmm. the chief people officer role. Mm -hmm. In fact you recruited me. I did recruit you. <laughs> Which is a little bit regrettable I, now. <laughs> I, I, I remember the day a, a mutual friend of ours dropped a resume on my desk way back at Covey Leadership Center and said you gotta call this guy and we talked and then I said why? <laughs> no I didn't. <laughs> then you still terrific. ask why. <laughs> <laughs> Tell it us about terrific. the book. So the book is titled Get Better 15 Proven Practices to Build Effective Relationships at Work. Yes. Uh, why 15 and what was sort of the genesis inspiration beyond your own role, you, you, you mentioned you've worked with probably thousands of people, right, in terms of coaching their careers to success and perhaps coaching even outside the company. Right. Why 15 and kind of what was the inspiration for the book? Yeah, well, there, there was not necessarily a magic number about 15. It started with 21, actually. Wow. And, and then we realized, okay, is somebody gonna read through all 21 of these? And it felt, 15 feels a little overwhelming. Yeah. It's not that you have to do all these at once, but nevertheless, So you took Stephen's seven habits times two and added one. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> just to make sure I was still ahead of the pack. <laughs> Um, so, so the inspiration, as I, as I mentioned, is that uh, I've been in a unique role like we all are in unique roles. And you know, you could teach me oodles mm -hmm. about marketing and, and maybe I could teach you a, a thing or two ab about relationships. And you have. <laughs> but it's, it's just that that's where I spend the, the bulk of, of my days, coaching. Yeah. And again, it's not that I'm the know-it-all either, it's just that I've had the vantage point of seeing what works, what doesn't work, and, and learn from my own mistakes. So that was, that was the beginning of the book. We actually uh, designed, as you know, designed this book to be, it was a much smaller version it was a little gift uh, mm. coffee table right. type book. Right. And there was such interest in this thing that we never thought we were going to even do much with that uh, we had our great publisher Simon & Schuster come to right. us and say, hey, we think there's, there's something really worthwhile here to have you know, Franklin Covey, the people company, and have the chief people officer from that, from that company share their experience in how to build effective relationships. So that was the beginnings. M makes sense. Uh, the book really has achieved you know, bestseller status in the Wall Street Journalist. You are, I know, crisscrossing the world. I mean, you're speaking around the world. You were in South America recently. You're out every week, mm -hmm. in addition to your current job, speaking to clients and giving keynotes at conferences. And I just look, look at the list of media, the podcast you're doing and webcast, and it's pretty expansive. You're headed to the Middle East in mm -hmm, a few weeks. Mm -hmm. You're going to keynote the World Business Forum. I mean, this is a lot in one year, or in less than a year. Why do you think that your, your book, from someone <laughs> who has, you know, a profound impact inside of our company globally, but, you know, not a lot of notoriety internationally, <laughs> uh, why do you think the book's done so well so fast? Yeah. Great, great question, and it has been really overwhelming, and I think, I, I don't think I know the topic is relating to everybody. 
everybody's relating to this thing that relationships do matter. They're not just this nice thing to have that makes the workplace or, or even our personal lives better. It's actually foundational to getting everything done, getting things done the right way, being really effective. We get results, you think about it, unless you are a pro golfer, Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe you run a company where you're the only employee, the rest of us get our results with and through others. And so the effectiveness of, of our relationships really drives all of our success in life and therefore our, our happiness. That's why I think everyone is relating to this book. And um, you could argue it's a, a leadership book for leaders at all levels of an organization, including outside of organization, in your community, your family, right? It's a leadership book in many ways. It, it is, and, and as you know at Franklin Covey, we, we also uh, state that leadership is a choice, not a position. So it, it absolutely has been a great guide, and I've talked with many formal leaders about it, but it's about really anybody who's trying to expand their circle of influence with whether they have a formal leadership title or not. So Todd, not dissimilar to a lot of Franklin Covey's solutions, there is a companion card deck. So you and the team you worked with created kind of a fun card companion guide for those of you who joined us for the uh, interview with Stephen M. R. Covey on the Speed of Trust, mm -hmm. we worked through his card deck. You use this deck when you're out with clients, giving speeches, working with groups and such. Uh, it's, it's a great tool because it kind of brings the book a little bit portable as well. Uh, there's two practices I'd like to focus on today especially. Okay. And of the 15, there's two. Practice one, uh, wear glasses that work. I want to talk about that if you will. And then practice five, see the tree not just the seedling, which I'd love to learn more about that as well. I'd like you to talk about those two in particular, and I'm sure you could t we could talk about all 15, but we need you know more broadcast. Maybe I'll invite you back. But <laughs> Please. In the context of leaders and leadership, uh, particularly what I might call first level leaders, perhaps people that are um, leading smaller teams, perhaps leaders for the first time in their career, maybe mid junior level leader. Uh, it's in our research, in my experience, that one of their key challenges is transitioning from the role, both behaviorally and sort of mentally, from being what was probably a very competent individual contributor, independent producer. And they probably were, were exceptional at that because they got promoted because of that. And now working into a role where no longer should they be doing all the work, but instead a, a fundamental shift in what they do by working with others and getting results you know, through others why is that such a challenge? And have you experienced the same? Okay, yeah, certainly, yes. So, so first of all, starting with, with practice one, wear glasses that work, it's, it's, it's practice one for a reason, because the way we see things drives everything that we do. And of course, we, are, we, are know that, we already know that, the, the, that what we do, or our behaviors, gives us the results we get. But more and more, I run into people, including myself, that forget to step back and say, wait a minute, how am I looking at this? And over a period of time, we sometimes convince ourselves that something is a certain way when it's really not. It's just that we've seen it that way for so long. That's why it's so critical to this, this very point that you're talking about. When we have a new leader, and sometimes uh, a not so new leader, but still she or he has not made the mind shift to say, wait a minute, I'm no longer this individual performer viewed as how do I get results by myself. I'm responsible for this entire team getting results. It is a challenge, and it's, it's one of um, fear because, gosh, we got to make sure that we produce. I better just jump in and do it myself. It's, it's one of impatience. You know, we've, we, we got promoted in most cases mm -hmm. because we were so successful right. in our individual role. So now we're leading a team and we're seeing them taking a lot longer than I would take to do that thing or this thing. And so we, we jump in and want to do it for them. Because it's what we know. It's it, how it's we got we our know. success, right? Exactly. We also have this, and it's, it's wrong, but we have this misplaced fear of, I'm the leader, I've got to know everything. I've got to be an expert at everything. And so I, I feel like I've got to step in and be doing a part of everything so that I'm still seen, it's a little bit ego driven, I'm still seen as boy, he's the great or she's the great leader I was contributing. The greatest leaders step back and say, my role is to develop others. My role is to yes, get results, but not by myself, with and through others. And it's, it's easy to talk about, it's hard to do. The people who are most successful at it, whether they've been a leader for one day or for 20 years, they remind themselves of this every morning. They get up and they remember, my number one goal is to get the results with and through others. How am I doing that? Am I developing Susan? Am I developing Joe? Are, am, I, am I stepping back? Do I have the patience? Am I letting them stumble and fall? And maybe I don't even know that they're, they're doing it wrong. I don't know everything, you know, but am, am, do we have the patience to help develop others? 
I imagine there's also a wisdom or maturity that comes over time realizing that my team members can get the same results that I got by even taking a different path. That Absolutely. my way isn't the only way, but it's easier said than done, right? Because as a leader, as an individual producer who became a leader, you were probably used to and ingrained in your own paradigm and processes and behaviors. It's a struggle also to uh, unleash and allow people to say, to see them do it differently and kind of hope that they're gonna get the same That's result. That's right, I, I, exactly right. In fact, I'm just thinking of, and I've been in a leadership position for, gosh, better part of my career now, more than about 30 years. And just recently with a, a particular survey we were doing here at Franklin Covey, there was a, a, a summary, a way that I wanted our, our CEO and some other people to see the summary report of this. And I had in my mind how to do that. And a person who's been with us for six months, She's really talented. I don't even know how talented she is yet. She surprises me every day. She, and she came to me. I had in mind how I wanted to see this thing. And I shared that with her. She came to me and did just that. But she said, I had a couple of other ideas. She showed me three different ways that are 10 times better than what I had ever envisioned. And I'll tell you, it's really liberating when you can get to that point to sit back and say, wait a minute. Not only am I helping develop people, I can actually take a little of the pressure off myself and just let them run with it. And I can be freed up to do some other things. So it's an ongoing mindset shift for a brand new leader and for a leader who's been in, in her or his role for a long time. And something you said strikes me as profound is it's important that leaders don't have the mindset that they have to know the answer to everything. It takes some confidence and maturity, right? To get to that point to where you weren't hired or promoted because you do know everything you are hired and promoted by reminding yourself each morning that your job is to help inspire the best out yeah. of everyone on your team. That's exactly yeah. right. Hopefully you were put in your leadership position, or if you weren't, you'll, you'll get here pretty quickly. You were put in that position because you have this talent for bringing out the best in others. Hmm. I mean, I just, I, I really can't think of much, much that is more important in a leader than her ability to bring out the best in others. You know, uh, some of the context on card one, wear glasses that works, resonates with me as well. Are you seeing people in situations accurately? Have you ever discovered that your version of the truth wasn't so true or complete after all? I know that I have struggled with this because I have this tendency to kind of take a snapshot of people in a moment of time, and I view them that way throughout their career. Mm -hmm. And I think more and more it's a disservice to them and to me because I limit their genius, right? I limit their productivity in my mind because I see them as what they were at some point early in their career. And I don't think that's been, um, been fair, right? Mm -hmm, or helpful mm -hmm. to either of us. Mm -hmm. but now that, as I read your book and read the card, I'm more mindful of allowing people to mature and progress in my mind like they deserve. No, it's, and you're, you're humble and, and, and great to, to admit that. And I noticed you had to take off your glasses to actually yes, read wear glasses that work. But no, 50 next month. <laughs> I think what you just expressed, we're all guilty of at one point or another. We, we, we meet someone or we work with someone in a particular role and we kind of pigeonhole them in that role. I, I know I've done the same thing. I'm thinking of a, of a person here at Franklin Covey who has done great in every role they've been in, but they came on as an event planner. And they were like an event planner, like nobody's business. They were remarkable. Well, this person in a few short years is one of our top performing client partners now, our account executives out around the world. And it's surprising for some people to, to see that person and say, wow, I thought they were doing this. Well, they were, but as we say in our mission statement, greatness lies within everyone. Yeah. You know, we, we believe that greatness truly lies within everyone and people, whatever they set their mind to, boy, if they have the right leadership and the right skill set and tool set, they can become whatever they want to be. How'd you get so wise? Yeah. No, seriously, I hanging mean, around people like yeah, you. No, but I mean, uh, you have spent the better part of 30 years listening, coaching, advising. I imagine a lot of tough conversations, mm -hmm. right? What are some things you've learned about, probably Todd, the thousands of interviews and the thousands of difficult conversations you've had with people? What have you learned inherently about people? Wow, that's a deep question. <laughs> I would say. I would say in, in, in pleasant and in difficult conversations, I try to remind myself, everyone wants to matter. Everyone wants to, wants, you know, we, we all want to matter. We all want to feel understood. We all want to be a part of something that matters. And that really helps guide me regardless of the conversation. So that's kind of a foundational thing. I don't do it perfectly all the time, but I try and remember that. So, so it's an interesting way you ask that question, but I try to remember that, gosh, this is a human being in front of you. They care, they care about 
what they're doing. They care about the contribution they're making or not making. They, wa they want to matter. So I think remembering that first and foremost. I think, uh, again, as our great content teaches, the deepest need is, as Dr. Covey used to say all the time, the deepest need of the human heart is to feel understood. And when I first heard that, I didn't disagree with it, but I, I thought, boy, is that really the deepest need of the human heart? Well, for me, it certainly has proven true. And for the, the thousands of people that I've worked with and interviewed and met with, it really is. Be, feeling understood is probably more important than anything else. So I think as we're working on our relationships, as we're working through difficult or pleasant or whatever situations, remembering that, boy, it's important that Scott feel understood right now. It's important that Todd feels understood right now. I'm guessing, because I know the answer, that <laughs> as the chief people officer, at the end of the day, all of the people problems come to you. All the well, I hope issues. not all of them, but a lot, <laughs> but a lot of, them of them do. do. Well, I've seen the line outside your office some days. I once heard the question asked of you, if you could say something to people in the waiting room or have a sign out in the <laughs> lobby of HR, what would it say to those that are in the queue to have you solve their problem? Answer yeah. that question for our audience. No, what it's, would the sign it's, in the, the lobby say? It's a great question, and, I, and you do know the answer because I was asked this earlier. But I, I, I've thought a lot about that. And if there were a sign that I could somehow plant in people's minds before they came and talked to me or, or really any anybody, it would say, have you considered the other person's perspective? Which has a lot to do with, you know, I'm wearing glasses that work. Not agreed with them, not disagreed with them, but have you thought first, I wonder why Scott is feeling this way, or I wonder why Todd is feeling this way, or Susan. Have you considered the other person's perspective? And if we can start there, if we can get people, I found great success in my conversations with others, if we can get them at least empathizing with the other person, not agreeing, but just thinking, okay, I understand they're feeling this way because the pressure's on them or they're doing this and that's maybe why they treated me this, out, this way. If we can get the conversation started there, we can, not quickly, but we can then really start to make progress on resolving the situation. I'm guessing the majority of your discussions in HR are about some conflict with other people. Is that fair? Majority of the time, yes. Which mm -hmm. is really the premise of your book. Uh, as I read your book, you state that in fact, most organizations view their people as their most valuable asset. That's right. And you don't, you don't argue against that. You take it a step further and say, in fact, it is the relationships between those people that is a competitive advantage for an organization. Talk a bit about that. Yeah, you can have, just what you said, you can have all of the right talent. You know, Jim Collins likes to say, do you have the right people on the bus? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you've got to start with the right talent and not arguing against that, but it's really the nature of the relationships between those people. Can they collaboratively work, work together? You hope to have very differing opinions and different backgrounds and, and all of these things that makes for such a rich, great culture, but then how do they communicate? How do they effectively work together? How do they hear each other out and decide together you know, what the best idea is or what the, the correct solution is? It doesn't have to be my idea, your idea, but how do we work together? That's the real magic in, in truly winning cultures. It's the nature of the relationships. And I imagine how do they even resolve their issues so they don't have to be out in the waiting room of HR, right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they have, right. Do they have the maturity and the skills? Yeah, right, right. right. And in many ways, your book is sort of a, a manual for how to get along with others. Well, t to that very point, more often than not in my office when I sit down with someone, they've come in to say, this is going on, this is going on, this is going on. I will say, so have you talked to Alan about that? Well, no. Tell me why, you, why, you, why you're hesitant to talk to Alan about that. Well, I just don't know what to say. And I find that more often than not, just having a conversation, just going to Scott and saying, hey, Scott, I'm not quite sure how to address this, but I want you to know Here's, here's a challenge that I'm feeling. I could be right. Just start the conversation. I think we're all waiting for the magic words or if I don't say this just right, I've blown it forever. Not true. In fact, just ask for forgiveness before. I, I say this phrase a lot to people and I mean it from the heart. I'll say, I'm probably going to say this wrong, so can I just get these ideas out and then if I say something offensive, will you forgive me and let me have a do-over? That's not a script, but it just comes from the heart and it allows me to get the conversation going so we can resolve things. Mm -hmm. Let's move to number five, practice five. Okay. See the tree, not just the seedling. Kind of relates a little bit to your story about the event planner who moved to one of our highest yeah, producers. Yeah. Your, your tagline says, with people, do you often conclude that what you see is what you get? Uh, are you quick to decide that someone doesn't have what it takes? Talk about why this is five. Yeah, seeing the tree, not just the seedling, is all about seeing potential in others. And whether I'm in a formal leadership position or not, if I truly have, it doesn't mean, you know, Pollyanna, everybody's great, everybody can do everything. No, you do have to have the right people with the right skill set. 
but more often than not, I see people, leaders and others, that kind of write somebody off. They just, you know what, well, it, they didn't do a great job on this first project, so let's find somebody else. Now they have a target on their back. That's right, right. So that's right. In fact, we have, we have a, a really, I was going to say a great leader. This person isn't a great leader, but they're a great person. I know this person, I've known them for years here at Franklin Covey. And they are in a leadership role right now, but they and their team struggle because they really struggle with this practice. They're, they're looking for perfectly formed diamonds instead of you know, diamonds in the rough. And we've presented, from a recruiting standpoint and otherwise, we presented not even diamonds in the rough. They're, they're pretty good looking diamonds already, but unless they're perfect, this person passes them over. And as a result, their team struggles more than anybody else. They, I think they'll get there, but they just, they don't have an end, have, I don't think intentionally been unwilling, but they don't have the ability to see and have the desire to pull the potential out of others. So it's a, it's a critical, critical practice. You know, my, I, I tell this story often, but it's because it means so much to me. I will never forget my 35th day of employment at what was then called the Covey Leadership Center. The woman who, who hired me, her name was Pam, and I was hired as the recruitment manager, as I mentioned. And after a company meeting, she walked me up to one of the members of the board that I had not met during the interview process. His name was Robert, and she said, Robert, I'd like you to meet Todd Davis. And I'm shaking this gentleman's hand. And then she said, let me tell you what Todd Davis has done during his first 35 days oh, of goodness. employment. And, and I, I got sick. I thought, what, what is she doing? What is she going to say? I couldn't think of one thing I had done in 35 days. And then Pam went on to say he filled a position in Chicago that was vacant for six months. He put together this recruitment strategy for the next year. He's got a relocation policy in place. And, and Scott, I'm not telling you that to say, wasn't I wonderful? I'm telling you that to say, I remember that it's moment still visceral. right now. It. Yeah. And it was 22 years right. ago. Right. She saw yeah. potential in me. She could have easily just have said, hey, Robert, this is our new recruitment manager. He's awesome. He's doing a great job. And that would have been nice. But what she did, noticing the details, seeing the potential, seeing the tree, not just the seedling, it made a difference that I will, that I will say has made a difference in my career to this day because she, she saw my potential and boy, I did not want to disappoint her. So I spent the next several years making sure, right, right, or at least trying to, that I yeah, right. you know, exceeded her expectations. That's, that's the power in seeing the tree and not just the seedling. Todd, in our final couple of moments, uh, share perhaps some of the insights from your book uh, what do some of the best leaders, most effective, influential leaders do as it relates to managing, leveraging, nurturing their relationships with others? What are some key themes you see for those who ascend to significant influence in organizations? Yeah. Well, uh, they do each of these 15 practices. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a great question. You know, practice 15, which we haven't talked yeah. about, practice 15 is titled Start with Humility. And, so why uh, start at the end? Yeah, and I get asked that all the time, and it's so that we'll talk about it, okay? I wanted to make the point that you can, as a leader, to your, to your question, you can do all of these other 14 practices and all of the other things that leaders, good leaders are coached to do. And if we don't start with this foundation or this level of humility, we will not be successful in our roles as leaders. Great leaders, truly level five leaders, as Jim Collins calls out, they have this foundation of humility so that they don't have to be everything to everybody. So that it's not about them running their race. It's about helping their team win the race together. It's not about them any longer. And it's a challenge. And it's a challenge with really good people, not ego-driven people, but I'm a leader and, and I'm like the surgeon in the operating room. I, I better know my stuff, but I also gotta be compassionate. I gotta have great bedside manner. I gotta be developing and coaching others. So I've got to have this credibility as the leader, but sometimes we confuse having the credibility with, well, I got to know it all. I got to have all the right answers. I got to do everything. No, humility is a strength. It's the great, I, I believe it's the greatest strength you can have. If I have humility, then I come to work every day. I'm all about seeing Susan and Joe and Fred and Debbie be successful. It's not about me, it's about them. Todd, I had to have you back to another session because <laughs> I wanted to learn about carry your own weather, and avoid the pinball syndrome and make it safe to tell the truth. These are good topics. Well, I so, talk about them all day. So you come back sometime? <laughs> Love to. Awesome, great insights. I think the one thing that I, I took away from today is the best way, a way, a solid way for a new leader to make that transition from individual producer to leader of, with, and through others is to every morning kind of remind themselves that their key role is to inspire the talents and passion and results with their team and not to find themselves stepping in and interrupting and saving the day, right? You, you, said, it, you said it perfectly. It's absolutely 
an ongoing process and you've got to, however your ability to remind you or whatever you choose to remind yourself, it's got to be a daily thing until it becomes the norm and you just realize, nope, that's my role. Just develop, see the best and pull the best from others. Todd, congrats on the book. Thank you. Uh, good luck in the Middle East and in the uh, uh, Far East <laughs> yeah. and everywhere you're traveling to. We'll miss you, but we're, um, we're delighted that um, Get Better's done so well. I also hear from a little bird that you're involved in another project. Tell us before we end a little bit about the next um, book you're involved in. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm privileged, very privileged to, to co-author a book with two other phenomenal authors. The working title right now is called Everyone Deserves a Great Manager. And it's, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot about what we've talked about. While the target audience is new managers, you know, there are several studies that have been done on this where people on average are put in a manager or a leadership role at age 30. They don't receive any formal leadership training till age 40 or 42. So there's this wow. big gap of, okay, right. well, I guess I'll just figure Winning it out it, for yeah. the next 12 years. We have found that's, that's not only true of just new managers, that's true of it. We've got seasoned, seasoned managers who still are missing some of the very basics of what it is to be a really great manager. And as the title suggests, everyone deserves a great manager. So really privileged. That's, uh, that's about nine months to a year in, in, yeah. the, in the workings right now, but yeah. really excited to be on that project. And it's modeled after one of our solutions as well. That's right. right. That's right. Six critical practices. Yeah. That's correct. That's exciting. We'll have you back in a couple of weeks or months and get to some of these more salacious um, uh, titles as well. All Great. Right. Great. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for joining us. And if you enjoyed uh, this session and others, we invite you to share the link for the weekly newsletter to anybody in your organization or family. We'd love to have the, um, the breadth of this On Leadership series uh, be global. So thanks so much, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.